This month's CE is going to be on Active Attack Integrated Response. You may have heard this termed in the past as Active Shooter Response. We're getting away from that designation in order to cover the largest scope of these events, uh, such as an IED attack that happened in Boston or vehicle-borne attacks that happened in New York or Charlottesville, Virginia. The AIR program was developed through the Alert Training Center, which is located at Texas State University in San Marcos. This system is being used through NFPA 3000 and is now the standard for all federal response agencies. AIR is a multi-jurisdictional and multi-disciplined response. Due to the nature of this type of event, we can expect a large response from all of our law enforcement partners in the area, as well as additional fire and EMS organizations that may respond. The full AIR program through ALERT is a 16-hour class that's delivered over two days. It utilizes both classroom instruction and several different training scenarios. Due to the size of our respective departments, differing work shifts and schedules, we've, been, we've moved this to a single eight-hour class. The CE is a primer for the single-day instruction. It's going to focus on some general practices and terminology. It is not meant as a substitute for the eight-hour class. The eight-hour class is going to deal with this particular animal only, meaning that it's going to have a very different structure than any other events we may handle as both police or fire agencies. There is no way to predict where or when these incidents might take place. We need to have a simple, dynamic plan that's ready to handle a combined response from multiple agencies and can grow as needs demand. This is going to be a law enforcement event. Fire and EMS units are going to be used in a support role. The eight-hour class is going to focus on command, staging, and our actions inside of the building. It's meant to get us working all off the same script with the same expectations of how it's going to work. There are elements of this operation that are not going to be covered in this class. In the police side, we are not going to be talking about evidence collection or eyewitness interviews. On the fire side, we are not talking about transport destinations or reunification. This is again only this particular animal in dealing with what happens inside the building and the command structure and staging setup. This slide is just a quick overview of what the air alert program is going to look like and how it's going to be set up. We're going to be covering our initial response by police, our establishment of a command element, and our co-location of that command element with fire and police officers. As soon as our command element is spun up, we need to establish a staging element and staging location. In staging, we'll be forming our rescue task forces. We'll be reviewing during the class our direct threat medical care, which will be largely focused on our law enforcement officers. Our indirect threat medical care, which is when the RTFs arrive inside with fire and EMS, and then rapid evacuation of our patients to a hospital. The operational goals for this program are to stop the killing, stop the dying, and rapid casualty evacuation. You're going to hear this mentioned several times throughout the class. Think of it as three clocks that all begin once the suspect makes its first attack. We want these clocks to end as quickly as possible. The first one stops when our law enforcement officers make entry. They isolate, neutralize, or distract the suspect. The second clock stops as soon as medical care is provided by initially by our law enforcement officers on scene and by continued follow-up care by fire and EMS as they enter. The third clock ends when the last casualty is evacuated off of the site. The next three slides are going to be a quick overview of our main priorities. Stop the killing is going to involve our initial response by our first in officers and also our follow on officers. This training component is going to be basically a review of the alert level one program and is going to be provided by our alert law enforcement instructors. It's going to cover exigent and tactical response. We'll also cover our initial LCAN report, which is locations, conditions, actions, and needs. We'll talk about isolating, neutralizing, and distraction of the suspect, and we'll also go into direct threat medical care that will be provided by our initial law enforcement officers on scene. Our second organizational goal is to stop the dying. This is still going to be heavy on our law enforcement partners as they're continuing their initial medical care inside the hot zone as we transition to a warm zone. Additional officers will be charged with establishing a security element within the building and also establishing casualty collection points. Upon entry of our rescue task force teams, they'll be able to provide follow-on medical care and triage of patients inside the casualty collection points. Security officers will also be trying to identify ambulance exchange points and establishing security for those areas. Our third operational goal is rapid casualty evacuation. 
Security is going to be established at exterior ambulance exchange points by our law enforcement officers. Once our RTFs are ready to move a patient from the casualty collection point to the AEP, they'll radio out to command and command will order an ambulance or medic unit to that specific location. The goal is that the ambulance or medic unit arrives at the AEP at the same time that the RTF does. This is going to be a quick transfer of patients into that unit. This is not a patient staging area. We want that unit to arrive on scene. We want them to load those patients and leave as quickly as possible. Once that ambulance or medic departs, our RTFs will get back on the radio and receive orders from command whether to return to the casualty collection point or return back to staging. We'll review a couple of terms in the next few slides. Our last cover and concealment is our last position of cover before entering the crisis site. Remember that cover offers you ballistic protection, whereas concealment only conceals you from view. It doesn't offer you any physical protection. Our casualty collection point is any room or area within the site where patients are consolidated, treated, and triaged. There may be several CCPs within that site and each needs a designation. RTFs are going to be sent to a specific CCP within that building. For example, RTF-1 will report to CCP-2 in room 225, second floor east. RTF-2 will report to CCP-3, room 342, third floor west. So these two terms, room boss and med boss, have grown as this class has grown. Um, it's two leadership positions inside the room that are in charge of their own individual aspects of that room. The room boss is the police officer that's in charge of the CCP. They will designate security, begin an incident action plan, and begin the initial medical care. They are the initial contact for those incoming RTFs. The med boss is a fire EMS officer that will or may assume the med boss role, which oversees medical care in the room and starts the triage process for the transport of the wounded. This may be a paramedic supervisor. This may just be an experienced paramedic. These two individuals work together inside the room to control the CCP and manage that aspect of the scene. The ambulance exchange point, the AEP, is an exterior area secured by PD that has close access to the casualty collection point. The AEP is not an ambulance staging area. This is still in the warm zone. The AEP will have a dedicated security element and patients should arrive at the ambulance exchange point as the ambulance arrives at that location. Patients arrive, load, and leave in as short a period of time as possible. Ambulance and medic crews can expect at least one red patient and two to three grain patients to be loaded per unit. These numbers may change. This is what we are planning for, but it may change in real time. These next few slides are going to go over some of the changes in doctrine for not only the police department, but the fire department. Probably the most dramatic changes are going to come on the police side as we're teaching things in this class that are going to be quite different from what has been taught in police academies and in tactics over the past 15 years. This is just a quick overview. We're going to go through this much more in depth during the class. But one of the initial things we need out of the first responding officer is an LCAN report and for that officer to assume command of that incident. Giving that LCAN report gives information out to dispatch and follow on units so they have an idea of what is going on inside the building. And by taking command, that officer puts himself as the contact person within the building. The establishment of command by an officer exterior in the building is of the utmost importance. Now, we don't know who that's going to be, whether it's the 5th officer, the 10th, or the 15th, but someone has got to be outside that assumes command that is able to start channeling those incoming resources so that it's not a mass onrush into the building. The establishment command and the establishment of a staging area gives incoming officers and incoming fire and EMS somewhere to meet up and proceed with a tactical objective as a group and not just single officers pushing into the building. One of the other ideas that's being changed is to hold what you have. Uh, there's always been the push to continue to clear the building and clear the building and clear the building on the law enforcement side. What we're looking for in this instance is to clear an area where you are, but where your patients are and maintain that area. The secondary contact teams that will be established in staging can continue on and be directed to clear different areas of the building. It stops the self-deployment of officers in the building and it establishes some security and contact teams that can move and be in communication with each other. 
Those initial officers inside the scene can begin dir their direct and initial indirect threat care while other officers begin clearing the building. We don't want to bypass people that are bleeding out or who are wounded in order to continue to clear a building that may be empty. We need to take care of who we have in front of us. This type of event is going to be managed under a unified command system. When that law enforcement officer assumes command on the exterior of the building, it's going to be up to that initial fire department officer to find him or her and link up. They are probably going to be operating on more of a mobile command system than we do, so it's going to be probably up to us to find them. These two officers need to establish an operational plan and begin the organization of the assets. One of the key ideas that we'll be focused on in this class is the idea of co-location. You'll find this in command, staging, and inside the room, inside the CCP, as a med boss and as a room boss. One of the primary ideas we are trying to get across with this class is this idea of co-locating together. By co-locating, both fire and law enforcement are together in the same position, listening to each other's radios and trying to anticipate needs within the structure. Once command is established, the staging officer and staging location must be designated. As fire officers, we do this on a daily basis. We can take the lead on this and help this organizational element get set and get processed as quickly as possible. Once staging is established, all incoming resources are going to be directed to report to staging. There we can begin building rescue task forces with the combined law enforcement and fire department presence. The formation and movement of our rescue task forces are going to be the key to success for this incident. Our RTF should have a minimum of two law enforcement officers and two fire and EMS. More than likely, if we're working within the, the city of Houston limits, it will be two to three law enforcement officers operating with an HFD engine or ladder company. Our RTFs are going to be born and broken in staging. They act as a team and they remain as a team. The law enforcement officers assigned are the security element for that team. They remain with that fire crew for the duration of events. They are the guardian of that team. They are not to leave that team to assist with any other actions within the site. This group stays and remains together throughout the duration of this event. One of the questions we get asked quite a bit during the class is who is in charge of the RTF? Well, it's a simple question with a two-part answer. Our law enforcement officers are in charge of movement into the site and into the casualty collection point. They have absolute go-no-go -no -go authority over the team's movement. If they are unable to secure a section of hallway, everything stops until they get that security element in place. However, once they make the CCP, our fire and EMS are now in charge of patient care and triage. They are the ones who decide who goes first, who goes second, and who can stay in the location. For HFD, our initial rescue task forces may have an additional officer added to assume the role of med boss once they arrive at the CCP. This may be a paramedic supervisor or it may just be an experienced paramedic that we can trust to make those decisions inside Doctrine changes for fire and EMS. In the past, fire and EMS have generally been staged away from the incident and waited to be called into a cleared area. This cannot happen anymore. We need to get medicine inside the warm zone as quickly as possible. EMS care in the warm zone is not the full care we normally provide. We are going to be using a simplified system to treat, triage, and prepare patients for rapid transport to the hospital. The type and number of events we are expecting to see in this kind of events need definitive treatment at the hospital and in an operating theater. Medicine in the hot zone is direct threat care that's going to be provided by our police officers inside the building. Medical treatments used for this event have been adapted from the TCCC program with information compiled from military trauma data from Iraq and Afghanistan. Direct threat care is meant for officers in the hot zone that have been injured. Elements of this involve returning fire, getting yourself or your partner off the X, using the ABCs of cover, which is accurate return fire, body armor and cover, stop life-threatening bleeding through the use of tourniquets, pressure points, and using the recovery position. Direct threat care is again care in the hot zone. All members should review tourniquet use and placement prior to attending the eight-hour class. Some of the priorities of this are to go high or die, which is going high in the extremity as possible, Tourniquets can be placed over closed and should take no longer than 20 seconds to apply to yourself. Two tourniquets will probably be needed to control femoral bleeding in an adult patient. For fire and EMS, this is going to be a little different than our standard protocols, as is some of the other medicine we'll be talking about during this class. 
Other methods of controlling bleeding are using pressure points in the body. This is used to address minor to moderate compressible bleeding. It's effective if used quickly and appropriately. Direct pressure can be placed using the knees, palm of the hands, or fingers over the artery proximal to the bleeding area. Know that you are going to be tied to that patient until you upgrade care through other means, whether it's applying tourniquet or establishing someone else to take over that pressure. This picture shows where the brachial artery runs from the inside of your upper arm and also where your femoral artery begins in your hip socket to your lower leg. Be mindful of how much pressure you're putting on. We need to put enough pressure on to stop the bleeding in that extremity. However, you're going to need to use a lot more pressure in the femoral artery to stop bleeding than you are in the brachial. If you're using a knee, be mindful of how much weight you're putting on that extremity to stop the bleeding. For brachial artery, you can use the palm of your hand pushing someone down on the ground, or you can use both hands in a clamping motion to stop that bleeding. Realize that you're going to be tied to that patient until we can get a tourniquet placed to control that bleeding effectively on a permanent scale. Another aspect of direct threat care is maintaining an airway. We do this by using the recovery position, which is gonna place the patient on their side, protects the airway in a semi-conscious or unconscious patient. Can be used on the left or right side, doesn't matter which. A secondary purpose of the recovery position that it identifies a patient that has been assessed by someone. In a room full of people, we need to use this as a marker to move to another patient and begin assessment and treatment if we come across one or two or three patients that have already been placed in the recovery position. Placing someone in the recovery position can be done very quickly. Whether we are putting them on their left or right side, the two extremities that are on the ground, we will extend out from the body. The two extremities that are facing up will simply bend at a 45 degree angle. You can hook the knee and the leg of the patient over the extended extremity in order to help maintain a balance point. By using the arm and placing it under the chin, we can maintain a natural open airway for that semi-conscious or unconscious patient. Again, that's the importance of this, is that it maintains that airway for that patient. Secondary to that is the fact that this is not a natural position for someone to fall in. So as we come into a room and we recognize someone in this position, we realize that either in a law enforcement or fire has already had their patient, their hands on that patient to do an assessment. Indirect threat care is medical care in the warm zone. This will still be initiated by our law enforcement officers that are inside the building. A secured casualty collection point will be established and law enforcement will initiate care there. They're going to be using whatever equipment they may have, whether they brought a go bag with tourniquets and chest seals. More often than not, they're going to be operating with what they had on their pockets or in their duty belt. RTFs are going to arrive and continue more focused care. The bath assessment and treatments are what we'll be using for this event. Bath addresses four key causes of preventable death due to battlefield type injuries. The four preventable types of death on the battlefield are bleeding, airway, tension pneumothorax, and hypothermia. We'll address bleeding by using tourniquets, junctional packing and clotting agents, airway by maintaining a recovery position or using the head tilt chin lift. Tension pneumothorax will be worked with occlusive dressings and chest seals, and hypothermia will just be simply making sure that the patient stays warm. We will be reviewing indirect threat care and our bath assessment much more in the class than we are in this. This is a very quick overview. We'll be spending quite a bit of time on this and the assessment as a whole once we're in the class. Again, everybody should be familiar and practice with tourniquet usage, where it's placed, how it's placed, and how quickly it's placed prior to coming to the class. Our indirect threat care bleeding sweep is going to be addressing our largest arteries first. So we'll be starting at the legs, moving to the neck, then our brachial arteries in the arms, then checking our torso, both front, back, and flanks, and then checking the head for any other severe bleeding we find. Again, our extremities will be treated with tourniquets and we'll be moving to more bleeding control in the next slides. Our second bleeding aid is gonna be wound packing. This is gonna be treating non-compressed wounds and junctional areas. This is your hips, shoulders, groin area, or armpits going to be using gauze or clotting agents to slow or stop bleeding in areas where the tourniquets cannot be used. Direct pressure must be held in order to be effective. Your normal gauze that we carry on an EMS unit is going to be five to ten minutes with direct pressure. Combat gauze or quick clot, that time gets reduced down to three or seven minutes, but you still must maintain direct pressure on those wounds in order to get that clotting to work. 
Do not attempt any wound packing in the abdominal area, the flanks, or in the chest cavity. This quick diagram shows our indirect threat care interventions. Again, we're using tourniquets on all our extremities. We're packing our junctional wounds and sealing the box, the box being front and back of the torso as well as the flanks. Our airway maintenance and indirect threat care is going to be pretty straightforward. Remember that a conscious alert patient can maintain their own airway and should be allowed to do so. A semi-conscious or unconscious patient should be placed in the recovery position to help maintain their own airway. We may have to use the head tilt chin lift method as necessary during these events. We'll also talk a little bit more about nasal trumpets and needle decompression in the class, depending upon the level of practitioners we have, whether it's EMT basics, EMT paramedics, or our law enforcement officers. This is a real quick description of our indirect threat care for tension pneumothorax. There's a video following this slide that'll help explain it a little more, but this is just a down and dirty description of what we're going to be looking for and what we're going to be treating. Okay, so tension pneumothorax, all wounds found in the chest, back, abdomen, and flanks should be treated with an occlusive dressing. If you determine that a lung injury has occurred, a chest seal is going to be your best treatment. Any patient with an injury to the chest, back, or flanks should be classified as red and needs priority transport. Hypothermia is another one of the preventable causes of death on the battlefield. With injuries like these, you can absolutely get hypothermia in Houston in the middle of August. All right, we need to keep these patients warm. There is the possibility that some of them are going to be remaining inside that casualty collection point for some time. We are not stripping patients down to initiate care. For every degree in body temperature that our patient loses, it begins to affect the clotting process. Below 95 degrees, that clotting process begins to slow, and below 92 degrees, that clotting process stops altogether. We need to keep these patients warm, keep their clothes on, find additional materials to keep them warm. Also make sure that we're not leaving people on a concrete or linoleum floor. Get them up onto a rug, get them in a place where we can maintain their body temperature. Our final priority is rapid casualty evacuation. The injuries we are expecting to encounter with patients in these events need an emergency room and then an operating room. We can buy many of these patients time with tourniquets, clotting agents and by maintaining their airway. However, rapid evacuation of these patients to transport units is the key to getting them into the hands of doctors and surgeons to provide them definitive treatment. We can absolutely buy time with our green patients. However, our red patients, those with chest wounds, abdominal wounds, flank wounds, need emergency transport to a surgeon. So again, this CE is not a replacement for the eight hour class. This is simply a quick overview to get some information out as far as terminology, some of the changes we're expecting. And again, we're hitting our operational goals and trying to explain those. Again, stopping the killing, stopping the dying and rapid casualty evacuation are our priorities in these matters.